स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया In this lecture, I am going to talk about quotient groups. So given a group G and a normal subgroup N, we have seen that the left cosets and right cosets of N are the same. That is the left, uh, the right cosets, and the left cosets. These are really the same because if you take a left coset, uh, well, if you take a right coset n x, then this is the same as uh, x times x inverse n x. But x inverse n x is equal to n, so this is equal to x n because this part is just equal to n. So every left coset is a right coset, and vice versa. Now we can define in such cases a binary operation on G mod n. Now it doesn't matter whether I'm talking about left or right cosets. Define a binary operation. on g mod n as follows. It doesn't matter whether I write left or right cosets. So I'll just write left cosets here. x n which is the same as n x times y n is equal to x y n. Okay, it's not enough to just write this down. I need to make sure that this is well defined. So the coset x n, uh, this x is not uniquely determined. I can replace x by any other element of this coset. And the right hand side should not change. So let's check that this is well defined. So if I take um, x prime equals xn, y prime equals ym, then what we have is x prime n dot y prime n is equal to x prime y prime n, but that is x n y m n and now what I can do is I can write this as x y y inverse n y m n so I have just added a y times y inverse after the x here and that's the identity so it doesn't really change uh, this expression but then notice that this y inverse n y this belongs to n. This m also belongs to n and this is n itself. So this whole thing is just x, y, n. So independent of the representatives we choose for the coset, we can define a binary operation on G mod n. And uh, the theorem is that G mod n is a group under the binary operation xn yn equals xyn. So we've already checked that this operation is well defined and it's not difficult to show that it inherits all the axioms for a group from the group G itself. So associativity um, for example, in identity, let's just check the identity. So I claim that the identity of G mod n, so now I'm thinking of this as a group, is uh, just the coset of the identity, that is identity times n. And um, this is easy to see just from the definition. And the inverse of xn is x inverse n. This again is easy to verify. Now for some examples of quotient groups. The simplest example is where you just take um, G to be the group of integers under addition and N to be 
the group of integers that are multiples of some fixed integer n. This n is a subgroup and since g is an abelian group, every subgroup is automatically a normal subgroup. And then the quotient g mod n is just the very familiar example of a finite group z mod nz which is integers modular n with addition also defined modular n. For a slightly more interesting uh, i.e. Uh, non-abelian example, let's look at uh, G to be the dihedral group Dn. Recall that this is the group of automorphisms of the regular n gon. Well, we think of it as a cycle graph, but we usually draw it as a regular n gon. So this will have um, n nodes and n edges arranged in a circle or you know, in the vertices of a regular n gon. And this group has two distinguished elements which we identified earlier, S and R. So this S um, is an element of order 2. It's a reflection about the axis that passes through 1 and the center of the regular n gon. And this R is an element which is a rotation by an angle of 2 pi i by n. And they have this relation S R to the i s inverse but s inverse is equal to s so i'll just write s is r to the power n minus i so this relation holds in dn now i claim that if i take the elements identity r all the way up to r to the power n minus 1 these n elements form a normal subgroup it's obviously a subgroup because they're just powers of r and this is r to the power 0 and uh, if i multiply two powers of r i again get a power of r so this is isomorphic to the group Z mod NZ. And so I need to check normality. A typical element of DN is of the form uh, S R to the J. Okay. So I want to check that if I take S R to the J and I use this to conjugate any element of N. So like I take R to the I. And so I must take S R to the J inverse. Then I want to show that this is again a power of R. So let's just work this out. So I get S R to the J R to the I and then I get S R to the J inverse is R to the J inverse which is R to the minus J and then S inverse which is S R to the I plus J minus I S which is R to the N minus I. So this again belongs to N and therefore N is a normal subgroup. And then we can ask what is the quotient dn mod r? Well, uh, sorry, mod n. Well, it's going to be a group whose order is um, the order of dn divided by the order of n, which is just 2. This is a group of order 2, and the only possible group of order 2 is z mod 2. So you can get z mod 2 as a quotient of the dihedral group by its normal subgroup of rotations. We have seen that whenever you have a group homomorphism phi from G to H, then the kernel of phi is a normal subgroup of G. Now, with the definition of quotient groups, we are a posi in a position to say that every normal subgroup arises as the kernel of some group homomorphism. So let G be a group and n a normal subgroup then uh, consider the group homomorphism from g to g mod n the quotient group defined by uh, phi of x for every x in g to be just the coset xn then uh, the kernel of this homomorphism is easily seen to be just n and therefore we see that n actually arises as the kernel of a group homomorphism. Okay, I will be able to further clarify the relationship between quotients, group homomorphisms and normal subgroups using what is known as the fundamental theorem of group homomorphisms. This is also sometimes called the first isomorphism theorem.
So what this theorem says is that suppose you have a group G and a homomorphism phi from G to another group H. Then G modulo, we know that kernel phi is a normal subgroup. So G modulo kernel phi makes sense as a group is isomorphic to the image of phi. Recall that the image of phi is the set subgroup of H consisting of elements of H which are images of uh, elements of uh, G in G under phi. So this is just phi G, G belongs to G. Okay, so that's the image of phi. And the proof is not at all difficult. It rests on our earlier observation that if you take all those elements G in G such that phi G is phi G0 for some G0 in G, then this is the coset of G0 and the kernel of phi. So we saw this when we were uh, looking at homomorphisms and their kernels. And so now you define phi bar, we'll define an isomorphism here. So we already have a homomorphism from G to H. So define phi bar as follows, phi bar from G mod kernel phi to image phi as follows. You define phi bar of x times kernel phi to be equal to phi of x for all x in G. Now this is clearly well defined because we've seen that uh, the elements that map to phi of x are going to be precisely the elements of uh, in the coset of x under kernel phi. And it's also injective because if uh, phi bar x kernel phi, if phi bar x kernel phi is equal to phi bar y kernel phi, then this means that phi x is equal to phi y. which means that uh, x is in the y coset of kernel phi and y is in the x coset of kernel phi. They are the same uh, coset of kernel phi. So this map is injective and this map is clearly surjective because any element in the image of phi will be in the image of phi bar just by the definition of phi bar. And all we need to check is that this map is a group homomorphism but that again is completely clear from the definition of the group structure on G mod kernel phi. So this is the isomorphism phi bar from G mod kernel phi to image of phi.